Now, before Ramesses embarked on any of these campaigns, one thing was to uh, create a brand new capital. He knew that Egypt was uh, changing in a changing world and new capital had to be uh, uh, established. So the capital moved from Waset to a new place in the Delta, not far from the old Hyksos capital, capital called Avaris. And this new city was going to be called Per Ramesses, the house of Ramesses. Eventually, it absorbed the old Hyksos cat capital into its, uh, its uh, expansion. But that's where Ramesses established the new capital. And he was quite right. Um, the buffer zone is Canaan. Beyond is um, Armuru. And beyond Armuru is the Hittites, the Assyrians and the Mitannis and the troubled Syrians. So he needed to be up there to see what was going on. So following on for uh, Ramesses, the great builder, what did he do? Well, apart from everything, remember he's ruling Egypt for 66, 67 years. He um, built the great temple at Abba Simbel for the sun god Ra Harapti. That's what it says in the inscription. If you look about above that central door as you go into the, uh, it was originally a rock cut temple, um, the image of Ra Harapti is that big and the Colossus of Ramesses is that big. So <laughs> he, he set himself up as a living God. That's really what, what it's about. And remember, his first name is Horus. So opposite his temple, well, first of all, in his temple, he's got all the all the victories of of Canaan and Syria in there, defeating his enemies, bringing order to Egypt. On the other side is um, uh, the rock cut uh, temple of his wife uh, Nefertari. And over there, she is worshipped as the goddess Isis. Now, this is between Elephantine and the first cataract. But Ramesses has decided that he's going to Egyptianize the Kushites because these aren't just uh, two temples built in between the first and second cataract. He builds another temple at Ger Hussein dedicated to himself as a living god. Then you've had Bet El Wali, which has a temple dedicated to Ramesses II. And then at Kalabsha, there's another temple dedicated to Ramesses II. Later it was usurped by the Romans. And then of course you have Dur, which is another temple dedicated to Ramesses II. So his intention was to Egyptianize the Kushites. Did it work? Yes, it did. Because six dynasties later, a 25th dynasty, an invading dynasty from Kush, invaded Egypt and ruled Egypt. And uh, they did it in the name of Amun, because these people started worshipping the god Amun in Kush, and they became Egyptianized. Now, another um, place that Ramses uh, added to was the city of Memphis. And it had two colossi statues erected at Memphis. The one that survives in the museum at Memphis today uh, represents 83 tons. Wow, that must have been an amazing uh, object to try and move. The engineering of the ancient Egyptians is second to none. The Greeks, when they started coming to Egypt and seeing what the Egyptians built, gasped because they were still living in fortresses which had wooden stockades at this time. Okay. Um, so, and the Romans are just uh, a bunch of uh, uh, lads on top of a hill in Italy surrounded by... Uh, a wooden stockade. That's how, 
<laughs> not even on the starting gate. Um, so yeah, a look at his image. <laughs> he looks about 23, 24. He was probably about 70 when he had the these two statues commissioned at Memphis. So in the afterlife, he wanted to look young, athletic, beautiful. Did he succeed? I think he did. Another temple which Ramses II added to was Luxor Temple, the Southern Harim Temple. Uh, remember the Feast of Opet? So Amun, Mut and Khonsu would leave uh, Karnak. They would journey to Mut's temple, collect her and then go down to the Southern Harim. And in the Southern Harim was the other form of Amun which had the equipment to seed the land. Remember the back part of um, Luxor Temple was virtually built by Amenhotep III. He probably replaced a mud brick structure that was there. Uh, before him, it was Hatshepsut was adding to this temple, but only in mud brick. Then during the times of Tutankhamun, the Colonnade Hall, which originally was started by Amenhotep III, uh, was finished during the reign of um, Tutankhamun, I and Hormheb. But there was only a very thin sort of probably mud brick pylon, which was supposedly in front of the uh, colonnade hall. So when Ramesses came to the throne, he had all these major building projects. He's involved in that feast of Bopa every year. So he sets out a new pylon, an open court, three bark shrines for the Theban triads at Amun, Mut and Khonsu, and to finish off the uh, uh, mud brick pylon in stone, um, creating that open court. So when the Theban triad came down, they had now had three bark stations for their barks to be housed in. The open court for the rest of the year was used by the public. So the public would come and they would wait for the, uh, the other form of Amun to come out of the Holy of Holies through the temple into the open court and it would make its circuit around the open court and hopefully it would stop and make a prophecy. Prophecies from the gods became law. So, uh, there were two uh, lawmakers. The king was the first lawmaker, he is there appointed by the gods and then the other gods, uh, deity temples could also make laws as well because remember that the gods are the stars in the nighttime sky but when daytime comes they change from stars into spirits and they live in the deity temples which the Egyptians have built for them. So the people and the gods are living in the same land. That's what Arkhenaten didn't understand when he tried to uh, impose the cult of Aten. He didn't understand that what he was interfering with was a thousand years of belief that the gods are all around us. They're living with us during the day. We're not on our own. That's what he missed. Let's have a look at the Sphinx alleyway. Um, probably started by Hatshepsut, added by the 18th Dynasty Kings and probably finished off by Ramses II. However, by the 30th Dynasty, um, the choice of that uh, local stone wasn't very good. It started to erode and a king called Nectanebo had it all refurbished. So the Opet festival was still happening during the 30th dynasty. So a highly successful cult is the cult of Amun-Ra and his other form down at the Southern Harim. Look at the colossal statues of Ramesses. Wow. Remember those Memphis statues? Look at them. The, uh, these two. He's as youthful and as athletic as he was when he was 25. And that's what he wants to look like in the uh, afterlife. These are a form of serdab for the common people to come and place their offerings and ask um, favours of Ramses' spirit. 
that's what they're there for so his spirit can go inside and communicate with the living either side are the obelisks this one on this side has been borrowed for, by the French and unfortunately in 1833 they swapped a dodgy clock which never worked with one of the Pashas who was ruling Egypt at that time for the obelisk so it's now in Paris at the Grand Place in Paris the other one still hopefully is at uh, Luxor hopefully it hasn't been swapped for a clock and been to Luxor for about five years it was there five years ago but you never know with the changing times at the base of those obelisks are some baboons now when you made your journey into the underworld baboons were very fierce creatures and you'd send them on in front of your boat to cut off the heads of any snakes or scorpions that may be lurking waiting to destroy your spirit now the ones at Luxor are pretty eroded but the ones in the Louvre Museum are as good as the day where they were made so although the French borrowed or swapped a clock uh, for this obelisk and base they did conserve that frieze of baboons which you can see in the Louvre Museum in Paris. Look at the pylons. See those holes in the top? Those are for the flagpoles coming out and then there would have been these beautiful long flags draping down virtually touching the ground. So if you can imagine what it was like, the pylon was all painted, it had a bridge across which unfortunately has collapsed. The statues and the obelisks would have been placed, painted. Remember, this, these places were spectacles. This was going to be like Disneyland for the ancient Egyptians. So when you went to the temple, it was like a day out for you and your family. It wasn't just like, you know, popping into a holy place today. You fix it in with your busy day. It was there for a purpose. And in the Feast of Opat, the whole town would have celebrated by having free bread and beer provided by the Temple of Amun-Ra, the Temple of Mut, and the Southern Harim Temple. So the whole town is having a party time, not just for one day, but for a week, maybe two weeks. Would have been nice. There are numerous statues, standing statues of Ramesses II in the open courts. He wanted everyone to know who the benefactor was converting this area um, into an open court of stone, especially for the public. This is for the public. Unfortunately, the reliefs have suffered with sandblasting. So if you look at the uh, images, they're not very clear. The best time to go and see the temple it's three o'clock in the afternoon when it's 40 degrees in the shade because you get that sun directly on those reliefs and that's the best time to go and see this temple early in the morning it's great to be there but it's quite it's quite dark it needs uh, that sunlight to bring out the best of the reliefs that are left on the walls as i mentioned those are the three um areas for the bark shrines that are coming down from Karnak that's where they would be housed and you've got the image of uh, Ramesses above them uh, with the other form of Amun. What I forgot to mention at Karnak is uh, the temple of the hearing ear which was built by Ramesses II or was it? Look at the images of Ramesses statues Look at the image of the statues at the Temple of the Hearing Ear. They look very African to me, whereas Ramesses II looks very Semitic to me. Remember, his family came from Lower Egypt up on the Delta, which had Semitic connections. Look at that statue. I think he usurped that statue and stamped his name all over the place. I think that is the image of Amenhotep III. That's my only 
my only contribution in in what I th how I interpret the archaeology.